Good morning again, my friends. In the Word, in the book of Genesis, the story is told of how Jacob, fleeing from the wrath of, wrath of his brother, had a vision at a place called Bethel, the house of God. Beth, you see, is house in ancient Hebrew, and El, of course, is a reference to Elohim, or God. Bethel, therefore, is the house of God. And in this place called Bethel, Jacob had a dream. And in his dream, he saw a ladder or stairway extending from earth to heaven and heaven to earth. And upon this stairway and in his dream, Jacob saw angels ascending and descending upon this ladder. Now, almost 2,000 years later, our Lord would speak to Nathaniel and it is recorded in the first chapter of Mark and he would say to Nathaniel I saw you under the fig tree and Nathaniel would say in response Lord you must be the Son of God for Nathaniel knew he was not present to see him laying there and when he said this our Lord replied the day is coming Nathaniel when you will see heaven open and see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In Jacob's dream, he saw a way, a stairway, but nevertheless, a way between heaven and earth. And our Lord would come and he would say, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but me but by me. Here, here our Lord is claiming to be more than just a man from heaven. He is claiming to be the man from heaven who is himself the way to heaven. By that claim, he is laying claim to being the eternal doorway to an eternal existence while yet here in time. The kingdom of heaven is synonymous with the body of Christ. When Christ in his coming, his death and his resurrection established the body of Christ with himself as the head, he was not creating a temporal identity which hoped to have an eternal future. He was establishing, my friends, the eternal now within the bounds of time and while here in his body he said this I am the resurrection and the life if you believe in me although you were dead yet shall you live and if you live in me and if you believe in me you will never die now he's not saying our bodies will not physically expire no, our bodies will expire. What he is telling us is that we are more, so much more than our bodies. That our bodies are not who we are, my friends, but our bodies are simply where we are. And when our bodies sustain the life that is within them, which is our spirits and our souls, then we are in time. But while yet in our bodies, in times, our spirits, if they be renewed unto life through the living God, are assembled by the Spirit of God into the eternal body of Christ. It is a concept that is both elegantly simple and infinitely profound. Elegant and simple in that all who were born of the Spirit become one with Him to form one body. And profound in that while we live in time and while we live and move about in these human bodies, these human bodies themselves are not assembled into this corporate body of Christ. Why? Because what is born of the flesh is flesh and what is born of the Spirit is Spirit. 
And as it is written, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, it's not our bodies that are assembled into the body of Christ. If that were so, when our bodies died, then that part of the body of Christ would die. But we are more than just our body. Remember, our body is not who we are. Our body is simply where we are. In our modern hedonistic culture, there is so much emphasis placed on the body. It's hard for people to back up and have an eternal view of our existence where all of the emphasis that they see around them is upon things to be, to be put into the body, things to be put onto the body, things in which you pamper your body. Yes, today, today the body beautiful is all the rage everywhere we turn. In fact, it would be impossible without the discernment of the Holy Spirit for any of us to understand that our bodies are just shelters, temporary shelters for our spirits while we are passing through this realm of time. But while we are yet living in the realm of time, our spirit, our spirit, my friends, is already being assembled by the work of the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. And because of this, my friends, we, as we live within time, are the dwelling place of God within time. He dwells in each of us through His Spirit as each of us abides within the body of Christ, experiencing the corporate reality of an eternal kingdom now while living within the confines of time and space. And this configuration within us is the dwelling place of God in this earth. This is the current Bethel, the house of God in time, the place where God dwells amongst his people. And this is the place within us where the eternal meets with the natural. And this is called the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a reality that clothes the body of Christ. The glory of the eternal kingdom rests upon the shoulders of the body of our Lord. What then is the identity of the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven in time, my friends, is the body of Christ. But all things about the body of Christ itself are eternal. Now it is true that the circumstances of the body of Christ are natural. That is, the, we live in the realm of time and space. But what the Bible declares to be also true is that we are not of this world. We were of heaven. We were of eternity. Whoever is born again is born from above and lives in the earth for and with an eternal purpose, an eternal direction. And that eternal purpose is both fulfilled and fully supported only by the power of His eternal kingdom within us. So, if we live as an eternal being in time, how is that maintained? How is our reality integrated and maintained within us? My friends, this is done by the power of God himself. So when you refer to the kingdom of heaven, you're referring to the truth that we have eternal life now. That we are in the body of Christ now. That we are a part of heaven while yet we are walking here on the earth. And at the same time, that our entire existence, body, soul, and spirit, is supported and maintained solely by the living God in heaven. The significance, the significance of this idea ranges across the board, my friends, from food and shelter 
to purpose and destiny, all as are we, are in the hands of Almighty God. And all, all of God is necessary for us to fulfill all of these needs. Again, from food and shelter to purpose and destiny. For the word says, man does not live on bread alone. He lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And this is how we are instructed through the kingdom. It is how we are motivated through the kingdom. It is how we are empowered. And it is the kingdom that leads us in its pathways. It's time that we begin to understand that we have been put on earth for heavenly purposes, not for the purposes of the flesh only. In fact, the earthly purposes are just the context in which our heavenly purposes take on their true meanings. Our Lord would have his children, my friends. He would have his children grow up and become who they are supposed to be because at the apex of our existence is the fact that we are spiritual beings created by God, placed into time to live out purposes known in the mind of God before we were yet in our mother's wombs. A person who insists on being fully earthly minded is someone who has no vision of life, no vision of existence, no vision at all beyond the vision of a consumer. What happens then is that the natural man readily bifurcates the wholeness of his reality into its components. Such a person thinks nothing of using crooked business practices or cross, crossing ethical lines in the pursuit of his personal goals, which are to be great, to be important, or to be successful. And then such people engage in the ultimate folly of becoming important in the world's eyes or in the ways of earthly power and having become successful in the eyes of the world. They then try to offer this worldly success in some limited fashion to God. And they do not understand when God looks at this folly and says in contempt, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Because in reality it is the offering of Cain all over again. Because of, because of this schizophrenic view of reality, the organized church has decided they simply cannot handle the doctrines and the presence of the kingdom. And so they have largely deferred the presence or the appearing even of the kingdom to after the return of our Lord. And in that way they've been able to, to, to dispense with the need to deal with the gospel of the kingdom at all. And consequently, the only thing that they deal with is a kingdomless gospel of salvation. But again, the things that are being said as, as to what a person needs to do are deliberately being said to point a person to a destiny of going to heaven, but not anything else. So for the majority of churches and churchgoers, there is no concept of a walk in this life supported by the authority of Christ and whose life is lived out within the context of the body of Christ with the purpose and direction of that life being changed, ruled and supplied solely through the kingdom of heaven by the Holy Spirit. If you don't understand that, then what, of your, what is your life going to consist of except trying to use God to promote your own success, which is what we see across all denominations. And that is why the Sunday Christians seem so routinely divided, both within and among themselves. They have visions and beliefs about heaven. 
but they're fully vested in trying to live in the earth in the same way that unbelievers live. And such a dichotomy does not result in peace. And there is no explanation of anything that happens in the earth in any other way and from any other viewpoint except cause and effect and experience. And why is this? Because the gospel that they preached is bankrupt. It is a gospel of the earth. It is a gospel of delayed hope. It is a gospel removed from reality, without power, without faith, and ultimately without value. And it does very little for the lives of the people who follow it. Their lives are not significantly impacted by the gospel that they are taught. Because it's really not the whole gospel, it's only a part of it. It selects items that are true and throws them at you without any kind of context. You see, my friends, the context of our faith is the gospel of the kingdom of God. There is no place in the scriptures that speaks of any other gospel. All of which means, all of which, uh oh, <laughs> just a second my friends, there we go. There is no place in the scripture that speaks of any other gospel. I had a cat walk across my foot uh, and tried to crawl up my leg and it made me mo lose my place momentarily. Now I'm convinced that this other gospel they are preaching is the very thing we were told not to preach. And that is what they are preaching today. They talk about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ and his ascension to heaven, all of which are true. But without the context and the structure of the kingdom, they don't know what it all means in terms of its application, in terms of the daily walk. So they limit it. They limit it to a simple gospel of salvation with decidedly fleshy rewards. And they say, if you will try Jesus, he will save you and will take you to heaven. And some will even add that he will change your life. All of which are true. But in this case, they are true but anemic. For without the kingdom and its presence now in your lives, the gospel that they try to walk is so much less than that which our Lord came to give us. My friends, the kingdom is within you. All of the kingdom, all of the kingdom comes with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, who is in you, reveals the nature of God and reveals why you are here, empowers you to function here in the things that God put here for you. You weren't just created and dumped on the planet to sort of squirm your way up and then hear the good news of going to heaven and stand up in that, and that's the end of it? My friends, the kingdom was prepared for you from the foundations of the world. When you refer to the kingdom of God, you're referring to authority and power that comes from the throne of God, and I assure you, there is no higher, no greater authority. To see the kingdom... You must be born of the Spirit. To enter the kingdom, you must actually step in the Spirit across the barrier of the rational. And to do that, you need faith. That is, you believe in the thing that exists of which you have no or very limited evidence. But it is not seen. For the kingdom is within it is invisible to the eyes of others, so it requires belief. But the single greatest sin in the church today is the sin of unbelief. Our Lord put it this way, The work of God is this, that you believe on the one who has been sent. And in my earlier analogy of Jacob's ladder, our Lord said to Nathaniel, 
Nathaniel, if you believe, you will see heaven open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Those who believe in the existence of the kingdom admittedly are not going to be well received by those who only live in the rational. Those who believe in the kingdom are not going to be approved by those who believe only in the rational again, only in the rational. The funny thing is that people who believe in the rational they think they're the smart ones and they've got the edge they've got the advantage when what they have what they really have is a self-enclosed blindness for they seek to explain the existence of everything using only the tools of the rational now I have nothing against reason in and of itself but you understand I will not give in to the imperialism of reason. Reason by definition is a highly limited tool. It is limited to the measurable, to the quantifiable, to the observable, to the scientific if you will. And there are things that may be properly studied and observed in this methodology. But my friends, the kingdom of God is not one of them. For the kingdom, the kingdom is an eternal existence in time now now in this dichotomy the great tool of our enemy that he uses is unbelief and he entrap entraps men into this cycle of unbelief those who do not, do not believe in the present existence of God's eternal kingdom who believe in nothing outside the rational these are the ones truly to be pitied because they are at a profound disadvantage. By definition, everything that exists outside the scope of the rational does not exist to them. If you cannot prove it, it does not exist. Now that's a fascinating thought. But don't you see? That's the power of it. If they believe that it doesn't exist, because I can't see it. It prevents them not only from seeing, but even from looking or knowing that they have in fact not seen. The kingdom of heaven was created, my friends, by God as the operating context in which to protect and preserve his children from the enemy and at the same time the kingdom was created as the overlying context in which the body of Christ lives out its destiny of sonship an eternal destiny known in the mind of God before the foundation of the world it speaks of both the power by which we are meant to live and of the present reality in which we daily walk the power by which we live is necessary because our enemy understands how to entrap us. Our enemy knows that man lives primarily by his soul and by the reasoning of his soul, by the rational process. And he knows exactly how to use this against him. The human being desires greatly to pursue understanding of all things that stir within the breast of his passions. But if all that you have are the tools of the reasoning soul, then whatever conclusions you come up with will be tainted by the rational process you use to get there. So the enemy sets this trap not on the path of the Lamb seeking God by His Spirit, for he knows he cannot succeed there. No, the enemy lays his traps for the natural man on the path he uses is much more li likely to be successful because he stalks and lays in wait in the path of man's emotionalism and man's rationality for he knows that these are the only tools the natural man has to understand the eternal things around him at that point you see 
the natural man has very limited tools to distinguish truth. So he tries to dialogue in the flesh with eternity. And the product of this process is a counterfeit of the truth. This alternative is the product of the rational soul. And it's called and presented to us in this world as religion. And this counterfeit is really a pro product of this interface between the flesh and the kingdom of darkness, for it is the only part of re eternity that the natural man can dialogue with in his natural state. But you, my friends, have a destiny, an individual destiny, and you are part of a corporate destiny. Personally, in your life, there is a destiny that God put in you to be lived out. And this is the way it pleases God to live through you. But you are part of a greater eternal destiny. And in your brief moment in time, you cannot expect that your life is meant to be the fulfillment of all of the destiny of the body of Christ. All that we are within our moment in time is but a part of a continuing progression of the eternal through time itself. If you don't see these things, then you will never learn to live in the freedom He has given you. When you die, you will finish your course, but all things eternal will not have begun with you, and they will not end with you. And even then, you will be just a bit part in the consummation of this great drama set up by Almighty God. These things you should know, and these things we should have been taught. These are the bigger picture concepts of the kingdom that give meaning and purpose and definition to the daily struggles of our lives. These things are the foundations of our faith, my friends. But unfortunately, they are not taught within the church today. What would appear to me to be the case is that men Men are obsessed with their own private pursuits, which they are willing to make into godly pursuits, if they can. And they try to convince others that these are in fact great and godly pursuits. But truly, unless we find our place within the great order of things of the kingdom of God to pursue the unique destiny He has created for us, we will not enjoy the support of the kingdom of God in what we do. What I mean by that is we will not move by the power of God. We will not move by the direction of the Holy Spirit. And what we set out to do will not be to God's glorious eternal purpose, either personally in us, or through us as a part of the living reality of his kingdom and therefore most of us most of what we do most of what they do though applauded by men will be viewed as pointless by God our Lord said seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness the word for kingdom here used is the word basilica. It is a Greek term and it means a foundation or a basis of power or rule. That is, where do you get your authority with which to rule and from where does it come? So when it speaks of the kingdom of heaven, it speaks of this authority to rule and to walk over, coming from heaven. The kingdom is on earth, my friends, but it or its origin is from heaven. So the authority comes from heaven. And when you speak of the kingdom of God, you speak about the very source from which the authority to walk above the snares of the enemy comes. It comes from God himself. So whoever is in the kingdom lives in an earthly existence within a context that is completely controlled from heaven. Think about that for a moment. Whoever lives in the kingdom lives 
by the authority that comes from God. Whoever lives in the kingdom of God lives by that authority of God. And whoever has the kingdom of heaven within him lives in the reality of the eternal while he yet walks within the constraints of time. This, my friends, is truth. It is power. And it is freedom. And it is the fulfillment of all the promises for our walk in this life. Until the next time, my friends. Goodbye.